of something that goes beyond the indexical listing of days of graduation and, 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 and milestones like that, but actually ties it to the world of ideas. And that's where I think for us it's so great to be able to be here in Austin and here at the university because it seems like this university is a kind of microcosm of the ambitions of shaping design, shaping the earth, recognizing the value intrinsic in that, and actually doing it in this intimate way in this incredibly large school. And that intensity really, and the beauty of that idea comes across as we walk around um, our little tour, both of Boston and of the school today. Um, one of the things that's very interesting for us is that we have had the luxury of actually having a wonderful students from your school here in our office. And the thing that has come across is a kind of optimism that they <laughs> You know, we could try the whiskers. <laughs>
seems to actually dominate that which gets built. So if we sort of move away from just looking at the new and novel, we start looking at the potential now of transforming sites at every scale. And whether it's the scale of the individual, or the collective, or the infrastructural, that's really a terrain that we think has a public role. So the most common ground in our work that these projects share is the section. And if you will, our practice has been devoted and committed to exploiting the richness that's often concealed within the section, but illuminates what it might be. So you could say these topographic preoccupations come from many, many sources, and I will acknowledge today that yes, I am the last semester of Jim Sterling's studio at Yale. <laughs> I am one of the students of it. So um, indeed, this question of what these kind of topographic forms might be, does this work at all, or is the map of the world good enough here? Um, <laughs> that if, any, if, if anything, though, these topographic preoccupations are not new or original, but in fact go far back in time. And if you look at the NASA lines here that you see from 460 AD, this idea of an infrastructural mark on the land that might be almost more philosophical and religious in nature, and nobody really knows what these inscriptions were done for, is an impulse that when we think about a flat terrain, it has one sort of legibility. But when we think about an urban terrain that's sectional in nature, all of a sudden now, the urban, how's this working? <laughs> um, but in the case of uh, this urban section here, now the ideas of movement, promenade, marking, and section actually have a different job. And this idea of infrastructure is so excessively generous and playful and theatrical that all of a sudden infrastructure becomes public in nature. So we've been preoccupied with this idea, if you will, of things that are simultaneously operating at different speeds cohabiting. And in this image here, you can see Le Corbusier had the same fascination when the automobile came in with its particular speed and the whole idea of cohabiting this high speed for cars and that kind of movement alongside the individual intimate little residence with its own porch and laundry and dining table. That strange coincidence in simultaneity is something that we're fortunate enough to live by in Brooklyn Heights. Um, and we're in this funny little condition here where at the very top level, you look at this bunk bed urbanism that takes the edge, if you will, of the bluff of Brooklyn Heights. And rather than accepting Robert Moses' planning to take through this tiny neighbor of Brooklyn Heights, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, there was a public revolt led by the intellects in Brooklyn Heights to then create this northbound, southbound local road on the three lower levels, and the gift of expanding the backyards of the private townhouses actually became a three-eighths of a mile public promenade in 1958. Now that kind of an idea is one that takes on all kinds of forms that Michael's going to touch on here. So we're perpetually provoked by the power of natural and unnatural forces, controlled and uncontrolled mobilities, so today, in the, fa fa in the face of so many simultaneous challenges, perhaps the challenge, the most important challenge, the charge for design, is less a consolidating ideal, but rather a more instrumental project where thickness and depth can intensify social, cultural, and natural reciprocity. So the unintended vulnerabilities, this is an image by Elon Bond, taken of New York right after Hurricane Sandy, the unintended vulnerabilities that we experience as our infrastructure has failed can be captured in this incredible image, but can also be conceived with the temporary resilience of art or entropy so vividly expressed with Smithson's spiral jelly, jetty can be embraced and leveraged. Now both of these simultaneous potentials raise deeper questions about interior and social landscapes. Is there a possibility for a more topographically and sectionally active project where movement up through over offers possibilities for a more continuous territory of design? Yet each challenge for us is highly specific. We've been trying to understand the possibility of creating in public nature one project at a time. So we'll start with this first project done a little over a decade ago, the Museum of the Earth in Ithaca, New York. 
It's part of Cornell University. And it inhabits this incredibly rich, like the university here, this incredibly rich, topographically varied uh, landscape. In this case, the Finger Lakes. As the last ice age receded, the Finger Lakes, in a way, are the kind of mark of the receding ice age. So they move almost in parallel north-south and track that incredible event. Locally, in the image on the far right, you can start to see where our museum is located. There are a series of fissures that allow the water to move toward the lake, kind of a series of, of cracks in the kind of shale and um, sandstone bluffs. And it's an incredibly aqueous and incredibly uh, productive, hydrologically productive landscape. So our goal was to add to this existing um, neo-Gothic building with a small museum, the Museum of the Earth, that would talk about the kind of big kind of idea that geology and biology are inextricably linked. In a way, you can see that when you uh, walk around uh, Lake Cayuga <coughs> in the kind of memory of this incredible receding ice age. And that kind of marking the land, this incredibly almost architectural cut into the landscape, for us was profoundly stimulating and profoundly inspirational. So the museum is actually broken into two pavilions. And what we discovered in a way was the story could be told in a, sort of in a much larger context. And we quickly discovered that it wasn't just about the architecture, but it was creating a site. And in a way, this was an epiphany for us. I and mean, I just started, we were very interested in the idea of landscape. And in a way, kind of back into this sense that shaping the land was as much a part of design as the design of the building itself. So the parking is terraced. It slopes into a series of parking trays. But the felicitous moment uh, was when we kind of realized that we could actually daylight a lot of the stormwater that would otherwise fall on this site and use it in the narrative of the museum so that in the kind of very present, you could understand the shaping of the past. And this was at the time a radical idea because stormwater was always diverted into a series of cisterns, dropped below ground, and never daylit and never made part of the kind of narrative. So the building is very sectional, and we like to talk about the building as starting with a series of parking rooms, descends into a plaza, the museum itself is sort of these two pavilions that in a way make a kind of gorge. And then finally, it completes itself into a water garden. So it's a kind of Guggenheim in reverse. You kind of enter at a middle level and then descend. In the process of that descent, you can also capture, and this is very important to the charismatic director who we um, absolutely adored. And you, you know, if you talk to him for 15 minutes, you become a paleontologist. But um, Warren Allman said, you know, this is not going to be a black box. We want people to understand that what we see today is part of a very rich past. So the idea was to capture this incredible landscape in the narrative museum, carry it, and certainly display what is one of the great Devonian uh, collections of fossils um, in the world, so that you could understand what had happened in this place, because this place Ithaca was covered by, in the Devonian, Devonian era, by an ocean, and really understand the kind of sense of the passage of time. So here you can start to see as you emerge from your car, there's a sort of sense that the buildings are, um, in a way, part of this kind of descending landscape. And um, you can start to see on the right a series of berms, and of course, after much discussion about water, uh, over the course of probably a year and a half of design, countless reviews, we ended up with the driest year on record. So uh, there it is, not a drop of water. Um, but fortunately, the year later, it was completely inundated with very, very heavy torrential rains. The museum itself is nested into the landscape, so we can kind of borrow the kind of thermal gift of the earth, but also talk about architecture as a kind of geologic uh, element. So at times, like the escarpments, it reveals itself as an overtly architectural element. And then inside, as I mentioned, we start with the contemporary right whale. And as you descend down, you are traversing uh, 540 panels. Uh, each panel represents one million years. So you have kind of a sense of geologic time. Uh, this is an art piece by Barbara Page. It was a little 
not so little, bit of black rock that you see on the far left. That's a Devonian fossil with a series of shells in it that talk about the very, very early development of skeletal structures. So you can start to kind of understand the connection between contemporary skeleton and a very ancient fossil. The water line, in a way, is marked by the window. So we are now essentially 12 feet below grade, looking up, back up at a contemporary moment. And then outside, we catch the water, carry it, daylight it, make it visible, and it becomes a kind of water garden that is cool in the summer and then freezes over in the winter. It's being Ithaca, it's probably cold three quarters of the time, and it gives incredible uh, collections of ice. And then finally the water, which is purified by these uh, uh, berms and ecosetum, which uh, takes uh, a lot of the uh, carbon out of the water descends into a detention basin. This was taken probably about six months after the museum opened, and it's now this incredibly lush and very, very active ecosystem with all sorts of frogs, insects that had not been there before. So in a way, it talks about the idea of entropy that so much uh, stimulated us when we uh, were confronted with uh, Robert Smithson's work. Um, very different part of the world, Taekwondo Park uh, in Korea. It's in a beautiful part of southern Korea, Muju, where um, you can start to see the kind of incredible topography. It's also where the ginseng is growing, so there's a very rich agricultural component to this landscape and an incredible topography. And we were uh, very much uh, seduced by the idea of the topography, but also about the choreography of Taekwondo. Taekwondo isn't just a kind of martial arts in Korea, it's a way of life, it's a philosophy, it's a way of living, a way of thinking. So how to bring these two together in the context of a competition to create a Taekwondo center. And the competition brief was kind of, you could see it written, they wanted seven buildings, all iconic buildings that would somehow kind of fill the valley. And for us, this valley, in a way, had an almost sacred quality. So we said, instead of a single building, why not push the building off to the edge, create a kind of continuous programmed element, and in a way, less about the iconic architecture, but more about revealing this incredible topography. And in fact, Korea has a very rich tradition, rich, rich agricultural tradition of terracing. So rather than multiple buildings, each one trying to outdo the other, as a kind of set of objects, we sort of saw this as a con kind of continuous uh, ribbon, starting with the amphitheater, the kind of main event of the body. Then there's a school, we kind of called it the mind. And then the sphere, of course, is a place of quiet contemplation. So this became an incredibly complex program that will evolve over the next 20 years. Away. It's almost a master plan for the city. And likewise, traversing the water, the route of the water, are a series of bridges that could be read as a simple way of moving up around the through, but also as a kind of narrative. And the water, too, is an extremely important narrative. It's not only important and precious and symbolic, but it allows us to kind of give architectural character and place to each of these different precincts. And of equal importance to the development of the architecture was the development of a kind of reintroducing or an agenda that was sort of largely architectural and lost. The program. So you can start to see how this takes shape. Uh, again, it's not about the series of isolated buildings, but about uh, topography. And that, that question of what the entropy of the an ideal of topography, a place, an occasion might mean was especially important where the actual world competitions are, which is in the arena. And so we're very much inspired by the Celadon National Treasures, which is an incredible art form uh, and craft that's well known in Korea. And so we actually looked at the idea of translucent Celadon shell forms for this arena that would be in the most focal and reflective body of water at the base of the hill. But as we go up the hill, in many ways, the school um, is actually embedded in these cross valleys. And as Michael described, our agenda of not actually imposing buildings, but actually embedding buildings within those secondary valleys, and framing what they actually call a parade ground, which is where they practice outdoors. Um, and that, that could actually host the library, the training, the swimming areas, and all the other support facilities 
such that even in the winter time, which is when Muju is, really comes alive because it's one of the ski destinations in Korea, that this too could actually host the kind of cross-country uh, ambitions of the kind of training that works year-round. And while the outdoors is extraordinary, the indoors is even better. Um, and the whole idea of swimming in these kinds of academic settings was something that they actually thought could actually be paired very magically with their program. But when we come to the place of the spirit, if you will, at the very top of the hill, what we wanted to do was actually carry the architecture underground so that on a series of water terraces, light might actually come through those water terraces and come into the spaces of the retreat at the very, very top. The agenda of these bridges as they cross become increasingly delicate. We thought of the bridges very much, very much about the way of the belts that you earn in Taekwondo, so that in fact it's only at the very top that the most fragile element is what's captured here. And so you're looking down the valley, and our hope obviously was that the architecture would disappear entirely, but the spirit of the entire valley is what would be legible. Now, it's under construction right now. Let's just say that when they do turnkey building, the general body, uh, uh, body, mind, and spirit are absolutely intact. Um, our Celadon, uh, Rina didn't quite make it, but so many other things are really coming together that have captured the agenda and ambition. But the agenda and ambition of working in areas that are vital and vibrant in terms of their political structures have never been so vibrant, if you will, in Washington, D.C., nor as lacking in terms of a public dimension on the mall. And so we were really fortunate to win this national competition to actually create again the identity for the Sylvan Theater, which came about in 1917 with Alice Pike Barney, to actually have a place of performance on the National Mall. Now, if you think about it, it really is our nation's most public stage. It really is where democracy comes alive, but it's also where performance could have life too. But if you look at the Sylvan Theater today, a sad little plywood structure on the edge of the security berms, it, there's so many things that make it sad. The first of which is that everybody in the audience on the base berm at the Washington Monument have their back to the monument. And you can see this structure right here, rejuvenated in the 70s, hardly, and painted a very thoughtful brown to blend. <laughs> um, but you could also see that the vista is not only just of the stage, but also of all the tour buses that come to the mall. Again, another disappointing artifact of evolution. So our question was not to just rejuvenate the Sylvan Theater, but actually look at this landscape as something that was broader and more connected. And if you think about the tidal basin in its kind of Sylvan sort of ideal, and if you look at the kind of formal mall, we thought it might be interesting to think of this as the hinge between those two, at the center as opposed to at the edge. And we also thought, that we could take the idea of the theater and actually say, rather than turning our back to the monument, we could actually flip the equation and turn our face to the performers and the icon, if you will, of democracy at the same time by simply lifting the land. And in lifting that also extend the kind of uh, lift in the other direction to create the pavilion and visitor services, of course, within these new lofted areas of land and take this kind of funny equation of the monument, the theater, and the tour buses and actually conceal, hide, embed, and actually do something so barely there that you can't imagine that it hadn't always been there. And really take the idea of the Sylvan Theater, which was simply a word, and bring the Sylvan or the trees back to that. So you can see that what it does, it allows us to focus a new central stage, a three-sided stage, I think it will be the only one in the country, where there's some main views, if you will, for uh, concealing, if you will, the kind of service and bus drop off that amphitheater, which hosts mm -hmm. about a thousand. And then the other amphitheater, if you will, created by the berm that hosts the uh, Washington Monument. And then this kind of chameleon section that runs across it actually drops down and back up again to host the pavilion. The idea then is to extend the Sylvan canopy, and of course, we're inspired by some other precedents that I hope you all know. Um, Swarthmore Amphitheater. Um, but then also then looking at this whole idea of performance and get all the scales of performance, whether it's intimate to huge, so we could scale 100 people on the side stage, 1,000 on the main berm, and 10,000 on the Washington berm. 
and then also leverage that possibility of actually extending the highest elevation of the new terrace to cross all the traffic to then connect to the Sylvan um, landscape, if you will, with the cherry blossoms and the tidal basin. So you can see this landscape being connected and taking this particular view, uh, which was again of the theater and of the buses, and actually concealing it uh, for performance and landscape. And then taking this uh, historic gateway um, and introducing an element here which says that there is a place that you could actually get a bite to eat on the mall. And then looking at the section both inside and outside to host this kind of idea that even theater, performance, and gathering could take place even across the winter stage. And in our hope, of course, and we're in the fundraising phase, we'd like to think that the magic of theater will inspire <laughs> all the donors that will come to the nation's central stage. Um, but one of the places that we had a great opportunity to experiment with these ideas of the hybridity of landscape and architecture is at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden Visitor Center. And it was a very interesting question, a very fantastic uh, organization in place, 52 acres in the middle of the city. Um, not so inspiring on the edges of it, uh, but extraordinary within. And the question was how to actually turn that little booth that you see there on the corner into a gateway that could actually handle the 44,000 people that come through on Mother's Day weekend, for instance. And if you will, they come through this funny little turnstile and then find their way through the garden. And our question was that if we could take this wonderful thing that is part of the city and a, a magical landscape and twist those languages together, we could actually take you the 400 feet into that that you'd have to get to to get to the Cherry Esplanade. Um, you can see it's really part of this Olmsteadian landscape and linked into uh, the park nearby. And our question then was, could we actually take the artifice of the architecture with all the copper roofs that were on the main Washington Avenue and actually slip into the garden with a new green roof um, and become somewhat less visible as architecture in the center of it. So this chameleon section makes its way from something purely architectural that you could see the lower end to something that disappears entirely, but structured emphatically to follow the paths. And in fact, actually inscribe light and trellises in ways that actually simulate the quality of light that's dappled through the wisteria trellises that they have in other parts of the garden. But these aren't just willful curves. Some of them are willed in by the garden. This is one of the few green cherry blossom flowering trees in the country. And so that that curvature that you see is following not only the, the, the tree itself, but the drip line below. Um, but choices between the city on your left or the garden on your right, we like to make very, very precise in terms of the choice. Um, the uh, visitor center itself is a place of education that follows the main path. And in fact, that path itself leads you in, from this slender gallery that parallels the uh, walkway into the only two-sided room that hosts 160 for bar mitzvahs and weddings. Um, we had an amazing sort of occasion where we had to take down one of the largest ginkgo trees. We were fortunate enough to be able to plane it, kiln dry it, recycle it, and use it for the acoustical wood lining that you see in this room so that it actually could actually host the air conditioning which vents which you see in there in homage to Sterling, as you can see with the puka um, air conditioner slot. Um, and open it up to the double study landscape that Michael will talk about. The building is overtly sectional. Mary talked about it as being a kind of uh, inhabitable typography. And the other thing, too, is there was a diagram of the old study and route. Another way of seeing this building is a sort of a thickened path. And actually, it converts in a kind of a knot. So people can sort of, in a way, experience this main space by continuing across the top. Part of the loop. So you can come across from the other side, uh, not overtly from the city, but from another part of the garden. You slide across, you look down, so the building has a kind of thickened lens, into the event space and into parts of the garden beyond that. You slide through the building, always outside but looking in. And then across, you can see some people sitting and standing up on the upper balcony. And then finally you can descend and you can understand that space in a completely different way. So the sense is the kind of choreography that we're trying to introduce here allows the architecture to uh, take on multiple roles. 
At times, the building is uh, extraordinarily thin. And it, more than anything, I think we're intrigued with the sense that it wasn't just about the kind of picturesque idea of developing a kind of architecture that ultimately appears and disappears, but also it has a very strong performative quality. So it's picturesque and performative. So the green roof, while being beautiful and it is actually an experiment for the gardens, a very thin, shallow roof, um, we're able to collect uh, water in a series of rain gardens. Those rain gardens then are transferred into a detention pond where the water is sufficiently clean and can enter the uh, storm system. The roof has uh, about 48,000 different plants, and the idea it is a kind of fifth facade, a sort of uh, a facade that is constantly changing, both in terms of the kind of experimentation, but also uh, seasonally. So the sense is that the building evolves and molds, and is very much a kind of chameleon. At times, it ultimately disappears, particularly uh, we've had an incredible winter that is ultimately terrifying if you're afraid of cold, but <laughs> fantastic if you love snow. And you can start to see the kind of grasses are really beautiful in the winter. They have this kind of russet quality. In the fall, of course, then it becomes this kind of almost surreal map. And then, actually, this was taken when it was first planted in the spring. It's incredibly <coughs> lush green. And one of the great sort of discoveries about architecture is things happen uh, in ways you can't predict. So. We have uh, new inhabitants uh, in the roof that uh, hopefully like the roof. Uh, aren't they cute? <laughs> Speaking of New York, uh, their studio costs $1,000 a month. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, they're in the roof. Uh, and, uh, but at times, it, it, as we sort of said, the architecture whispers. You can barely see it there. We're now standing at the Japanese garden pond. You can see just hints of it. And then, of course, uh, where it meets the city becomes much more overt. It becomes a very clear gateway into the garden, a gateway that can change, shift its perception, depending on the season. A very different project that we're very much still working on. We just completed phase one, which is essentially a waterfront park on Hunter's Point. Hunter's Point is a former industrial area just opposite the UN, so you get this incredible view of Manhattan. And in a way, it has this incredibly strategic location on the East River, because you can capture everything in a single, almost 180 uh, view corridor between the Queensboro Bridge, the UN, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building, and this very incredibly beautiful Con Ed site just to the south. Like many cities on the coasts, uh, this particular site was an incredibly lush wetland in ecology, parts of New York we kind of tend to forget. Uh, Pre-colonial eras were uh, incredibly lush wetlands. It turned into uh, an incredibly productive industrial uh, zone, and you can start to see, even as recently as the 1920s, it was a very active port. But we've come to kind of look at things a little differently. Uh, I think you do too, as we start to realize with climate change, we have to rethink some of our priorities, particularly uh, those of us who live in areas where the rising water tides and water levels are inevitable. One of the things we're particularly proud of, this is pre-Hurricane Sandy, um, you can start to see the proposed shoreline. The park is a series of, it's kind of like a necklace, there are a series of events and charms that follow uh, almost the pre-existing shoreline. And um, what we were able to affect was a, a largely soft shoreline, which at the time was, was um, just before Hurricane Sandy, was still a little controversial. And the idea that somehow water, as it rises, might become part of the narrative of this project, part of the design, was still an idea, certainly not original to us. Many, many other people were thinking about it. But it was a little scary to the Parks Department. So we didn't share those drawings. Uh, instead, <laughs> we talked about it green infrastructure, site circulation, and ecological bands. And in a way, use the, the, the narrative to kind of recover the history and introduce uh, kind of a working infrastructure, uh, a kind of subtle, softer, greener infrastructure. But there is nothing uh, natural about the New York waterfront and nothing natural about the edges. And, Kind of uh, like to share this drawing just to kind of 
remind ourselves that this shoreline has been changed, transformed, transposed, readjusted. So here you see it uh, pretty much as we started a couple of years ago. And then we imagine reintroducing the wetlands that used to be there, highly engineered. And then, of course, there are a couple of places where the promontory in this incredible strategic location could be further amplified. Michael just showed uh, this last image, and just so that you know, the working drawings in this particular piece go out on May 8th, so we no deadlines. Um, uh, but the first phase, though, which uh, is really high density use for uh, recreation, is really extraordinary because of its views across the river. It's far better to see Manhattan away from Manhattan rather than within Manhattan. And uh, what you're looking at here is the kind of daytime view, the one that the Parks Department really loved, uh, because this is an active playing field. Now, what's unique about this is that it also, and it actually uh, performed really well during Hurricane Sandy, it can actually hold very briefly a kind of influx of water, keep it from uh, making its way into the community, and then do a very, very quick release. Now, the other thing that was intriguing here is, as you look at this, this is the uh, the successful result of what we could call an unsuccessful dialogue between Parks Department and the, uh, the Design Commission. The Design Commission said all lawn, Parks Department said all artificial turf. They agreed that they would redesign it together and put a rectangle of artificial turf in our oval. <laughs> um, we thought, you know, with all due respect to their great intentions, we wondered if we might design our oval with those dual conditions brought together maybe in a different way. So you can see the crescent is natural grass and actually burned, so it becomes a kind of theater to watch the playing that goes on the artificial grass. Um, the other thing that was interesting is that this is a very high performing pavilion, if you will, in the background. We were told there were five little structures that we needed to do. We needed to do a shade pavilion, we needed to do a restroom, we needed to do a concession, we needed to do a maintenance building for the parks. And somehow we needed to get all those separately distributed in nice places throughout the park. And we said, let's just do one structure. So the structure actually is very hard working, begins as a very small maintenance shed, hosts the uh, concession, makes its way out to become the shade pavilion that then actually captures and meets the ferries that comes across the water. Um, and you can start to see all the episodes and events that are within the park from the uh, dog run, which is apparently the best dating site in Country Point South, <laughs> um, and a rail garden, which really recaptures that industrial landscape that had been right there at the ends of the streets, reinstated now to host a new garden. Um, the beach, Water Taxi Beach, which had been beloved and famous, now relocated uh, to the southern part of the pavilion. Um, but the pavilion itself is really doing an enormous amount of work, and that's not just the programmatic work. It's actually a folded plate collector of sunlight, sun power with solar panels, and also collects all the water. And by the way, that powers all the lights in the park, but also is a tilted back water collector so that it can do all the irrigation in the park. So that structure is one that's elevated just above the flood line. You can see it coming in in its kind of a sort of metal clad unit, <coughs> shapes that geometry, and of course all the columns are brought down to single points to actually open up the deck for the greatest use possible. It is fantastic though, because it is one of the few parks that you can arrive at by ferry, and it's one that actually has this kind of amazing prospect that changes uh, in extraordinary ways. So we're now working on phase two, which is a more bucolic end, and uh, hopefully that will be uh, built within a year and a half. But the question now of actually taking these ideas about what something small might be into a private world or corporate world for new artists is something where I'll talk about the um, visitor center that we worked on, and Michael will talk about the office building. We were fortunate enough to get two projects on their campus. And the visitor center has a lot of work to do because, in fact, pharmaceutical companies have a lot that they need to be very careful about, and so they do bring visitors in with great care. And so that question of taking something that really is a secure facility and making it a, a welcome one is one that we took very seriously. So they, it's really much, very much like an airport, air side, land side, with parking on one side and arrival. Um, but it really is taking the idea of using the land as a way to actually build up the idea of a gateway to make a passage into the new uh, Novartis campus landscape. 
but also be welcome at night to know that this is an emblem that lets you know that this is a place of light and illumination because, in fact, they're doing extraordinary work for Jupiter and cancer research and drugs. But it is a place that is intimate as well, so that when you come in and you arrive, um, that arrival is really structured in such a way that almost all the work's being done on those central columns. And it's one that that corridor passage to the garden on the opposite side is something that you see immediately uh, while you're being greeted. And I want you to know that that is a UT Austin student, Allison Wicks, posing beautifully on the far right. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's also what, when you come out on this side, you really now are in the garden. And that's when the shuttle then picks you up and takes you to your destination. But you have a place that you are waiting, you are somehow waiting in a place that's more welcoming than it had been before. Um, and it's one where, in spite of the need for security, and the fence is, of course, as necessary, 10 feet high, it's a fence that's comprised of a retaining wall and a kind of delicate trellis that actually sort of opens up to the landscape. So this is their uh, North American headquarters. They have a, a rather well-known campus in Basel, Switzerland. Their primary research uh, in terms of oncology occurs here. Um, and I think it was also a chance for us to think deeply about how people work, how people do research. And I think the traditions of a place of work and a place of play are being uh, questioned now. I think. You guys bring a computer into Starbucks, nobody thinks about it. You could bring coffee into a studio, hopefully. Um, so uh, I think we're particularly energized by the, the, the sort of sense that these two worlds are collapsed and interchangeable. The master plan called for very simple rectangular buildings. The master plan was done by Vittorio Lampugnani, who's a well-known planner. And uh, so first thing, of course, you do as an architect, you kind of say, well, how can I break the rules, right? Um, so the idea is we accepted the box and we decided to kind of carve into it and as we talked to the researchers and the folks that were to be working in this building, what became incredibly important is opportunities to break out of your very clearly defined workspaces and interact uh, much more socially and playfully and improvisationally. So you can see a kind of very quick sketch. Uh, that uh, talks about the kind of ascending series of living rooms or play areas in a way. And those play areas are inscribed in the context of a fairly well-defined rectangle. The rectangle are very simple loft spaces, very generous ceilings, um, all the electrical and mechanical distribution is in a raised floor. Flexibility was absolutely essential. People change teams every six months in this building. So, Things change, they get rearranged. The exterior of the building actually is a very, very uh, simple combination of three kinds of glass. I'll talk a little bit about it, but as the landscape grows, the landscape is done by Michael Van Blockenberg, the building in a way is seen as a way of intensifying both its context but also changing weather patterns. So that loft building that I just mentioned, very simply uh, organized around core areas, core meeting rooms, and then it's uh, wrapped by these kind of ascending living rooms and the kind of skin, the high performing skin, tends to uh, allow you to understand those two major programmatic elements. We love the way the facade, in a way, intensifies this incredibly dramatic sky. You know, kind of all these, it's a kind of typical architectural photography blue sky uh, thing, but you know, somehow the kind of drama of foreboding sky for us is, is quite, quite amazing. And it looks deceptively simple. Because we wanted the living rooms to be completely column free, they're actually suspended <coughs> off of a series of very deep roof girders. So that this sort of ascending dark zone where in this construction slot you see doesn't have glass in it, it's completely column free. And it's a little eerie. It's quite uh, fantastic and an incredible tour de force. I think we probably uh, aged our structural engineers by 10 years by asking them to do this. Um, it's also not only is it the idea of cantilevering, but because this uh, wraps three dimensionally, the structural forces tend to twist. So um, their uh, extraordinary engineers severed uh, and, and the scene that we're really 
terrific in making this what we thought was a really simple idea. Awesome. <laughs> So the, the glass actually is a combination of uh, mirrored glass and um, and very uh, light gathering glass, uh, and also uh, uh, acid etched glass. So you get a very soft patina. We'll talk a little bit about um, some of our explorations with different combinations of glass. But the sense that glass is both a material that can be reflective, translucent, transparent, uh, are all played out in this building. And you can start to see the kinds of mock-ups we do to try to test different levels of transparency, levels of performance, levels of reflectivity. You can start to see the acid etching, the vertical bands, the fritting tends to modulate the light, and then the, the kind of high-performing mirror glass, um, inner pane glass reflects. And this glass is completely clear. It's low iron glass, which is the clearest kind of glass. So the living rooms have a very really different quality from the inside. They're lined in wood. Uh, everything else is fairly neutral and movable. These are stable. They're kind of, you know, the kind of archipelago of islands in an otherwise um, fluctuating ocean. And of course, they're all equipped with uh, fairly nice kitchens because food, as you know, is the great lubricant of conversation and sociability. Uh, we also worked, which was really fantastic, we worked on the design of the chairs too, some of these sort of very big chairs that would allow you to kind of sit with a laptop and be somewhat private, like kind of old-fashioned wingback chairs. So there's a sort of sense of experimentation and kind of anthropomorphic of space. And then you can start to see on the south side, this wraps around and there are a series of outdoor terraces. We're now facing the building by the Japanese architect, Fukuhi Komaki, a beautiful building. Um, and we're currently working, this is very much a work in progress, so this is where Mary and I kind of feel like my like students presented to a, a jury. Uh, this is uh, on Roosevelt Island. It's a, a kind of an interesting experiment that Cornell and the Technion in Israel are uh, doing, which is to create a new high-tech campus that, um, in a way, is a kind of ground-up experiment in the kind of interaction between industry and academia. Stanford, MIT have been doing it, but this is a first kind of ground up experiment. So like with Hunter's Point, this is this incredibly strategic island, Roosevelt Island, which has been a kind of experiment for all kinds of different utopian dreams. And there's the site, and we are one of a number of buildings. Uh, the landscape is being done by Jim Corner. The original master plan is sort of shifted grid by SOM. We've been collaborating with Morphosis with Tom Main on a building just next to ours. So here's the site. It's this kind of lumpen uh, rectangle. We don't, couldn't figure out what to do with it. it. It was very awkwardly proportioned. So of course, the first thing we did was to sort of say, well, this is an incredible site. And an island has two sides. It's the Great Gift. So what if we shear the building open and capture views both east and west? And then further, what if we took the topography, because like uh, the rest of Manhattan, again, the kind of wide, rising water levels are creating a challenge, and sort of widen that and lift it so that we kind of create a piano nobile where people can hang out and introduce a little of topography in what would otherwise be a rather conventional. So this, uh, actually, this image here was very important to us. Among other things, we've got flood levels to work on. So bring, being able to really elevate the piano nobile had actually productive uh, ambitions as well. But this idea of actually creating a funnel, almost an hourglass, both in section and plan, to connect indoor and outdoor and river to river, was one that actually had topographic ambitions as well inside. The whole idea of this corporate co-location building is a kind of curious one. One-third academic, two-thirds startups. And the whole idea is to actually collapse the distances that are so broad in Silicon Valley, but still create this kind of entrepreneurial spirit with academia and with entrepreneurs co-located, in this case, all in one building. It's a heavy order. Um, but in fact, what they want to do is take this notion that in some ways the, ac the academy is almost behind the entrepreneurs because the delayed, uh, the sort of directed research with delayed application when it's merged with the kind of startup model, the old sort of barrage dream, could actually be something that could come together in this building where we could actually create 
two sorts of prismatic buildings around a center, more intimate in scale than that box that we had sort of looked at as a site, and that those prismatic centers could actually open out onto this landscape. Uh, there's Tom's Mains building uh, that you can see on the one side, ours on the other. Um, and it's one that this kind of scaffold of both laboratory, research, loft, if you will, mer merges around a center that pulls in the landscape. You can see a solar collector on the roof. We all, the whole campus is bringing in solar power for the campus. Um, but really one of the most important things was to say that it's not just the lab spaces where things happen, but it's the spaces in between. And so every bit of that topography and section is inhabitable so that the, each one of the staircases actually has work terraces <coughs> and places to be. But that landmark, if you will, sort of locked by water from the city on both sides is one that really is a kind of prismatic lantern uh, for the engine that should be 24 hours for research. Now this uh, engine for 24 hours of research is one where you certainly know that in architecture, um, that it seems to dial up around this time of year. Um, and in fact, Barnard College hosts Columbia University's undergraduate architecture program as well as Barnard's architecture program. And so when we were uh, invited to compete to this uh, international competition to do the Diana Center for Barnard College, we were struck by this kind of very interesting question Columbia University is huge, Barnard's intimate. Mm -hmm. Four and a half acres for Barnard, Mass, <coughs> for Columbia. Captured on two separate landscapes, an old-fashioned landscape uh, that was used to be its origin below and a more contemporary one above. But the expression of what a campus center might have been, again, a woman's college in the city in the 60s certainly didn't want to get too involved with the city. Um, but <coughs> this was the face of the campus. Um, and so what they had said was, we wanted to put a 100,000 square foot building here, um, and they wanted to be a library initially, that was the competition. And our first thing was to actually not use the footprint of the site, which is what, what was a given, but to actually make our work a little harder and <coughs> slenderize the site so that we could actually connect these two landscapes. So what we did was we actually made the building tapered so that from one end of the campus, the historic campus, all the way to the main gate, there would be an unobstructed sight line. And then we took that idea and actually said, what if that's a place of connection of landscape? What if we could connect all seven floors visually together so that all the different things that were happening on each level could be transparent to each other? Again, a landscape moving section through the building. So what that did was it translated this place of barrier into something that could be a kind of a luminous demonstration of what was happening at Barnard. Now, uh, the building changed. And after we uh, designed it in concept, it came in over budget, of course. And then they said, do we really want to just move books from one side of the campus to the other? Maybe we want to actually bring all the dynamic programs together, including architecture, into this building, along with a cafe and event space and theater, et cetera. You can see that the signature of having the chair of the architecture department on the group that was part of our team um, up there, that glass box up there, is in fact the senior architecture studio. <laughs> now, one of the things though that was important to us was saying that that separation between the historic landscape and the contemporary one was broken in half, not only by ADA, but just broken in half by these terrible stairs because there was a bowling alley below. And while there was great discussion, and the school papers were quite vocal about it, the bowling alley uh, was eliminated and we were able to create this kind of connecting amphitheater of landscape. But then that connection and section on the landscape was one that sort of took the ambitions and ideals of the crisscross walks that you see all over campuses laterally deployed in a quad and tipped them vertically into the stair that's actually inscribed on that one side, the north side of the building. Um, but again, the kind of genesis of our thinking actually began with this idea of these inhabitable volumes linked sectionally to a landscape. So that at any given time, when you're in the cafe here, for instance, you could see up and through the reading room, the library room, the dining room, and all the way up to the gallery critique space for architecture and art. Um, it's one that is kind of collapsing with the worlds, literally, even though they're private because they're acoustically separated by glass, are linked in section and made more public in nature. Um, also, when you're in the gallery critique space up here, this is where the uh, reviews are, you could look down through the library, the dining, the cafe, and finally out onto the lawn and have a sense of where you were in the building. Um, and a sense that could be both public or also very, very private. 
So the, actually the building, a third of the building is below grade, which allowed us to keep the building height at approximately the same elevation as its neighbors. But as the program changed, one of the things that was quite fantastic is it allowed us to really use this building to, in a way, celebrate Barnard's incredible program. It's a black box theater, there's an event space, um, there are a series of classrooms and studios, and of course, architecture and fine arts. So it's a very hard working building, a very mixed use building. The black box theater is below grade, and it's actually quite amazing. It's uh, about um, 10 meters, 30 feet, maybe 35 feet away from a major subway line. So the low, low frequency noise, which is the hardest to control, is mitigated because it's a kind of box within a box that floats on a series of Teflon pads. So it becomes a kind of machine for all sorts of theatrical events. That is, you ascend to a level that's almost half below grade. At the above grade, there's the event space for dance, musical performances, and larger events. It's a series of slip ellipses so the smaller ellipse allows for about 150, 200 seats to feel somewhat intimate, whereas the larger ellipse can accommodate 500. It's a very complex way in which we try to deal with a very uh, different set of scales. And then, of course, you can see the five floors uh, above grade from Lehman Lawn, which is kind of Barnard's, so in a way, it's their, their living room, their kind of front door. And Mary talked about the stair kind of being, in a way, the campus walk that's tilted and etched into the surface of uh, the west facade. Our, our client joked that this was the least efficient fire stair. And um, I think, uh, yes, uh, we proudly said, you know, architecture isn't always about efficiency. Um, sometimes inefficiency is a good thing. And this is a place where people meet each other. And the, the, the stair sort of slides down and actually moves in and out of the surface of the uh, building, so you always have a sense of where you are, which is incredibly challenging on a multi-story building. So our insurance carrier cringes every time we show him this picture. Um, what's amazing is that we never anticipated this stair would host a dance program. So every semester, um, the dance students are asked to choreograph a piece around this stair. It's incredible. Uh, serendipity that this has become a kind of very, very active place of uh, program. Um, so here's the stair as it kind of marches up and through and of course culminates in the, uh, the senior architecture studio with a kind of fantastic view of the city. And the facade is marked by uh, a little over 1,100 panels of glass that are arranged in about seven or eight different combinations. And Columbia University and Barnard uh, essentially live in a, a kind of a brick uh, context. And we were very interested in the sense that this building could align itself with its neighbors without necessarily being a brick building. And the trustees, I think, were very much in support of this being a forward-looking building. So in some ways, we were very intrigued with the idea of what you can kind of capture, in this case, with a kind of rough charcoal sketch, the sort of the kind of gray of the paper somehow left a mark that allowed us to play with glass in many, many different ways. So this is color integral, acid etched, translucent glass that has a fritting that oscillates between totally opaque and totally transparent. So there are three or four different methodologies for um, changing the kind of characteristic of the glass. <coughs> And of course, as soon as we said we'll match the brick, we discovered there are 50 different shades of brick. Um, and um, anyway, we just started playing around it. The other thing we discovered is that because the glass is somewhat translucent, if light penetrates it and hits a back pan, light will bounce back out and change depending on the quality of the light, the quality of the sun, the oblique or direct angle. And actually, the glass is exactly the same on the left panel as it is on the right panel. The only thing that's different is the different degrees of back pan color, from dark brown to fire engine red. So it's a rather fantastic realization that the building could change, could be a kind of chameleon depending on the time of day. So sometimes 
is overtly a kind of bright brick red, and you can start to see how that plays uh, off its neighbors. Um, it sometimes goes to a kind of much darker bronze, depending on the time of day. But here you see it very much a part of the kind of family of brick buildings. Uh, buildings on the right, by the way, are extraordinary buildings by McKinney and White. So if it was about the terror of being in the city in the 60s, right? This looks like a pillbox with machine guns to protect uh, the students at Barnard. Um, it was very much the colleges and our hope that this would become a kind of window that would actually do exactly the opposite, would invite a level of participation. So this is the second to the last project we'll talk about and just finish a nanotechnology center at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, that is incredible because uh, for many, many years it distanced itself from the city and now is starting to move eastward toward downtown Philadelphia, which has this incredible plan by Penn that uh, can be identified by these really beautiful and very logical rationalist uh, grid uh, that was established in the 17th century. So you can start to see Penn. Our building is the red building uh, that's identified. And we saw it very much as part of a kind of larger armature, a kind of checkerboard of buildings and open spaces. And it sits in what had been a rather dreary part of campus, a number of engineering buildings and chemistry buildings, not the kind of distinguished uh, legacy that one would expect. And you can start to see the site uh, kind of sandwiched actually between a very beautiful garage by uh, Romaldo Gergola done in 1963, and then a rather forlorn uh, lab building on its left. There's the site. And what was incredible was the equipment. Um, the microscopy equipment required uh, it to be positioned in what is called scientifically kind of a sweet spot to avoid the um, electromagnetic interference and vibration that would otherwise be present on this site. So there's a very, very clear spot where this incredible multi-million dollar uh, uh, set of uh, mi microscopes are positioned. And around that kind of sweet spot, we wrap uh, the idea of uh, uh, sending uh, promenade of circulation, and sending coil of circulation. You see in these kind of early studies, uh, attempts to deal with the sort of sense of the kind of origami of the public spaces, wrapping the very, very, very clear and um, clearly delineated workspaces of the labs. So there's the idea of a landscape which defines a core, which was never part of the program. Research and collaboration is kind of driven as you ascend through the vehicle of circulation. And then finally that's framed. So here you see the project as it opened uh, about a year ago. It's an incredibly beautiful uh, sculpture by um, Tony Smith. Uh, you see it kind of positioned in the middle of the courtyard. And then Penn's uh, black locust trees will start to become much more of this kind of tissue. <coughs> well, our structural engineers decided to work with us again after the trauma of uh, working with us on the Vardis. And I think we, we share this because I think too often we take certain things for granted. There is a, what, 80, 68-foot cantilever, which, you know, is uh, an extraordinary uh, piece of structural gravura. But our structural engineers reminded us that this kind of pleated wall that is alternately hung and supported with a lateral truss catching the wind loads is actually structurally much more complex because the loads are more dynamic. So there you see it uh, kind of wrapped in this sort of crystalline envelope of different kinds of reflective glass. And I think as Michael's talked about this kind of uh, and what we were actually trying to capture, it, it really was the idea of simultaneously being able to welcome in the kind of identity of a campus through the landscape, welcome in the idea of art uh, as part of the world of science and engineering, and also actually reveal a, a typically <coughs> hidden science. Clean rooms, because of vibration, typically are in the basement. You typically look at a window with a circular amber window, and that amber window blocks out the, uh, the ultraviolet rays. So our question was, if this is a hidden but dynamic uh, kind of research, what happened if we could actually put it on display? And we were told that we couldn't unless we could protect it from the ultraviolet rays. And we said, what if we then made the entire wall to that research room amber? 
and there was no reason to say no. Obviously, a lot of testing uh, went on to prove this out. It's the only one that's ever been done. But one of the things that was intriguing is that lab floors are 20 feet floor to floor. So what do you do? You actually need to actually, because elevators have to be in remote spots because of the 70 foot uh, electromagnetic interference sweep that needs to be avoided from the sweet spot of research, it means that circulation needs to rely on an irresistible stair that's still traveling 20 feet floor to floor. Again, strange sorts of coincidences. This uh, amber light actually is revealing the research inside. You need to go in a bunny suit to actually be there. Humans are the dirtiest thing in there, and that's why these bunny suits are so important. Um, the research is extraordinary. And that research is one where the kind of mechanical spaces are three times the square foot of mechanical space for every one foot of research. Again, because it's keeping all that air very, very clean. Um, but then some elements actually can be open to regular light, and this is a microscopy characterization below, again, at the lowest level to avoid vibration, but light is all right. Um, so we actually pulled the land down to bring light into the basement, and you can see that wedge beyond. Um, but this whole idea of the topographic obligation of connecting all the three levels of the labs to the, uh, the kind of uh, form space above takes place with this stair that you can start to see unfolding. And it's one where, because the Dean of Engineering at Eduardo Glant was passionate about art, actually is the hosting site or the hinge for Jean Menclenza. Um, but again, you could start to see that the stair is one where every intermediate landing is a place to collaborate and plug in and also be part of this larger landscape, pull the scientists out of the labs and into a more social place. Um, and also allow all the meetings and events and classes and seminar spaces to be seen and illuminated by this journey uh, through the space. And ultimately, when you get up to the uppermost 68-foot cantilevered forum space held back just enough to create effectively a porch, almost like the boat deck that looks out on the campus. Um, and it really then becomes a very intimate engagement, once again, in this woodline room, um, which hosts about 150. Um, it really is a very special room that reveals the simplicity of the structure there coming out like a shelf bracket. Um, but again, some of the research can take no light, and as we come around on the backside, the kind of pleated metal uh, skin here is one where we wanted it to at least emit light, even if they couldn't let light in. Um, so that pleating is actually very, very subtle, works on a gradient pattern. It turns around and becomes entirely flat as it reaches the point of the cantilever so that the specular nature of both the glass and the metal come together in this one <coughs> space of the forum. Um, but it does a lot of work, too. Philadelphia has major flood problems, so the kind of stormwater detention of the mechanical roof and of the social roof, if you will, right off the forum, um, is one where we actually really love this view because the simultaneous nature of the Tony Smith and the campus landscape below, the hard-working social landscape, and then the city beyond all come together. Um, and it's a place that is remarkable now for engineering is while all the labs are typically darkened to the world at night, this is the one that really creates the kind of belly button of light in the campus landscape for engineering. Um, but this question of what is the belly button of life um, is one in this last project really comes to new dimensions altogether because in Seattle at the Olympic Sculpture Park, it was a landscape that was created completely artificially through water, hydrological stuff, to actually create new land. And what happened is that this Denny Regrade, which was hydrologically created, those who wouldn't sell their land realized that they wish they had in the course of this creation of land. This is an amazing landscape in Seattle, but it's one where everything from that middle road beyond to the water is false. That was all fill. And so when the Olympic Sculpture Park was announced as a competition, the art museum said that they had a site. They didn't quite clarify that it was three separate sites divided by an arterial highway and train tracks. And they didn't really clarify that it was on a fully contaminated site from Union Oil of California or based on a crumbling seawall. Um, but what we thought was, well, wow, they said if they had enough funds, they'd love to cover it up like Millennium Park and actually cover it up and have one site. And we said, well, it's kind of cool that everything is wrong about it. And what would happen if you actually kept all the forces of the infrastructure as part of the expression of what might be a park that could begin at the city edge and wander to the water's edge? 
and in the course of that, leverage the 40-foot grade change and create different settings for art. So this was our competition entry. And what became intriguing, again, this idea of chameleon sections is one that allowed us to operate on the land to actually create valleys, bridges, and ultimately a beach, so that this particular landscape could become something altogether different. And that's 360,000 cubic yards of earth, thankfully excavated in the downtown museum's uh, subsurface garage excavation. So it was a really nice symmetry to get this land for free. Um, but what you can see is this really remarkable thing of saying, how can the infrastructural obligations, the artistic and ecological ambitions be simultaneously allow the Olympic Sculpture Park to become free and open to the public, but actually do more hard work? And in this case, you can see it's managing water, it's managing the contamination, it's managing a new subsurface infrastructure of two miles of conduit below, and it's also handling a new kind of surface that actually connects the city to the waterfront. This is it under construction, a new earthwork, if you will, where uh, our original budget for the project was blown out of the water by cord and place walls at schematic design, so we turned to highway engineers with a mechanically stabilized earth as an inspiration, and then came up with a precast panel system to cover them and also just go high enough up to become uh, a guardrail. So you can start to see that that kind of coloration, if you will, of the stone that's part of the site was actually reclad and recast, and then became, if you will, the new plinth for art, and one where the kind of topography of the city could actually leverage the opportunity for the pavilion, a kind of kunstall, to actually welcome parking below, or a kind of gateway or portal above. And so you can see the, uh, the kind of occasion of the ginkgo tree are welcomed in this newly artificial landscape which is both reflective and refractive and split in a way so that that unfolding design for the landform is also precisely the same agenda at a small scale for the building split to reveal and open up a kind of fundamentally raw space that could be seen parallel to the drivers uh, on the road all the way through or those who traverse it uh, to reveal something that is artificially created, if you will, as a valley here. Um, and you can see our drawings here were really very much about this kind of part natural, part artificial, so that you could see Richard Serra's piece, Wake, here um, as a kind of base of the valley and the pavilion beyond. Um, Richard was never too fond of the other activities that could also take place in the sculpture park. Um, but that topography really, we, that's what we do love about it, is its multiple natures. But also, we wanted to give measure to the point of these simultaneity. So literally and figuratively, at the center of this arterial highway is a pedestrian point that actually, uh, we like to think with a trip wire, could actually say that an extra 20,000 people visit the park each year um, by car. Um, but this is really the central point, And this is the place where you cross and actually are completely unaware of anything but the extraordinary vistas of the city and the port beyond. So rather than to do a heroic bridge that would have called attention to the design of the bridge itself, we've got a much more subtler approach, one where the landscape would slide over the road and you would discover it would be more appropriate and also be a setting for art. And we actually have had the, uh, the privilege of coming back. The park opened five years ago, so now we're reframing uh, the point of the park. Uh, metaphorically and literally, it's taken uh, a tremendous amount of foot traffic, which is a good thing. So we're starting to look at the different patterns that people have used. And so you can start to see the point that Marianne shared uh, earlier now is hosting a series of permanent pieces, like the Calder, but also a series of temporary pieces. So there's a sense of appropriation in ways that we hadn't originally these are recent photos by Ewan Bond, and they can start to show how the kind of quality of the landscape changes. The sort of very, very brown grasses, brown grasses, or these grasses were chosen because they, because they turn uh, this kind of golden brown color in the summer, so that the sense of the chroma would change and shift. So if you also slide over the highway, you can also slide over the train tracks, which are the second major barrier. So, this is a kind of early sketch, quite, quite uh, uh, still very embryonic, how to, how to create something. And 
It was quite fantastic because the need to protect um, people from either jumping or throwing things over the fence um, gave us an opportunity to work with Teresita Fernandez, who is an artist who created this uh, really beautiful throw fence called Seattle uh, Cloud Cover. And the kind of uh, the sort of fracturing of light plays in surprising ways and also plays against the kind of meter of the retaining walls and of the landscape itself in ways that we never predicted and in ways that Teresita had not anticipated. So it's part of a kind of an art program that is both very site specific but also part of an art program that will change over time. So the Calder is a kind of the only piece actually in the collection when they launch the competition. So here's the Sarah piece constructed in New York City shipped across the country and it was an incredible choreography and here's Richard like a proud father you know kind of, it's like his baby you know um, uh, a fantastic sculptor and an incredible with an incredible eye for uh, space so here's his piece nested and very much framed because uh, as we worked with him it was very important for him to feel that the edges of his piece were purely delineated so it was a a fantastic opportunity to work with the sculptor of his talent. Very different kind of art piece, which you see in the uh, greenhouse at the other end. And if Richard's piece is about weight and permanence, Mark Duncan's piece, you can imagine him proposing this to the trustees. He's going to do a big log, and it's going to uh, essentially rot for 80 years. Um, and Mark is very interested in the nexus of uh, art and nature so this incredibly beautiful and it's actually you can see the, the sort of narrative of it is housed in a kind of greenhouse that simulates the light qualities of the pacific northwest so if you stand outside you see the uh, olympic mountains where this log came from so there's this incredible uh, symmetry to it and then here you see the park as it kind of sits with these series of, of planned events and uh, unplanned events. Finally, you descend to the water, which in Marion's had said had been inaccessible. This was the parking lot in 2001 when we were just starting the competition. So it becomes reclaimed as part of the city. It's the first place where you can actually touch the water. And um, it gave us an opportunity to actually think uh, very deeply about the um, importance of salmon habitat. And um, very important to start to think about the fact that ecology and art aren't antithetical. This is a piece by John McClanza, who was also uh, the artist that Miriam talked about in uh, technology. Then. It's like, amazing. It almost looks like Photoshop. Um, but there it is, uh, just installed. So there's a kind of a sense of scale that gets distorted by virtue of the perspectival convergence of the architecture and the landscape, but also the art plays this kind of fantastic senses of shifting one's perception. So here's the waterfront as it was, a rather forbidding uh, array of rocks and concrete. And then this beach is completely engineered. There's nothing um, natural about it. It was a, an attempt to kind of reconstruct the beach. And we always joked, I think at that, this point, the last part of construction, we could only afford about 10 logs. <laughs> Happily, a storm came along, and all of these logs were uh, a gift that was completely unintended. So sometimes nature does work in miraculous ways. <laughs> uh, but it's a chance to restore salmon habitat <coughs> that's so important to the ethos of this area. Uh, Native American tribes from beard salmon and salmon and juvenile salmon have disappeared. So here's the beach on a kind of quiet, cold day. And um, there are a series of shelves, in a way we sort of think of this as a kind of underwater garden. And um, it's been fantastic because the University of Washington has monitored the return of salmon habitat. So we'd like to think that architecture does have a kind of proactive role in helping restore our maligned and tattered environment. We love the sense that the landscape can also be seen and not seen. So for us, the kind of water garden of kelp is just as important as what you see. 
So at times the park essentially bleeds into the existing landscape. At times it becomes very overt, very architectural, very much about the culture, very much about a setting, a setting where you can kind of frame the Olympic Mountains, a setting where a park can wander to the water's edge. And in closing, I think this is uh, an image from a rather uh, important opening day and uh, a more recent shot. So we'd like to conclude with our hope that in this project and the others we've shared with you this evening, the ideal and the circumstantial, the infrastructural and the temporal, can be collapsed to suggest a new form of public nature, one which can expand the physical in the philosophical terms of an architecture that can both critique and transform reality. Thank you.